Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Global Tourism Forum Leader Summit Asia from Jakarta, Indonesia. And we are now at the point where we can start the panel about China's outbound tourism market for Indonesia after the pandemic. And today I'm very happy to have two uh, very good experts for the tourism development in Southeast Asia. Uh, my name is Professor Dr. Wolfgang Georg Alt. I'm the chair today. And we have Gary Bauerman, who is the director of Check in Asia. And we have also Pauline Suhano, who is the, not only the director of EDOC Tour, but also the new president of Astindo National Board. Uh, let me ask both of you to give a brief introduction, uh, telling us a bit more of what you are doing and what is your background and your connection to tourism in. Southeast Asia. Maybe uh, going in strictly alphabetical order, maybe Gary, we can start with you. Yeah, hi Wolfgang and hi Pauline. Thanks very much for uh, in inviting me onto this panel. Um, my name is Gary Baum and I'm based in Kuala Lumpur here in Malaysia. I'm the director of Check in Asia, which is a strategic marketing and intelligence company. Uh, we focus mostly on, mostly on travel and tourism, but also lifestyle and consumer trends across Asia Pacific. I lived in China for six years, and I've lived here in Malaysia for 11 years now. Um, as you mentioned there, Wolfgang, I, in the introduction, I wrote a book seven years ago. Uh, it was published in 2014, called uh, The New Chinese Traveler, Business Opportunities from the Chinese Outbound Travel Revolution, which covered the development of Chinese travel from the beginning of this century, from about uh, 2000 onwards. Um, and so it was two decades of work. Uh, covering Chinese travel domestically, internationally, and around the world. Um, and I'm also the co-host of a podcast called the Southeast Asia Travel Show. Uh, we talk to travel industry influential figures in the travel industry here in Southeast Asia, across Asia Pacific, and worldwide. Okay, thank you very much for that. And yes, uh, I'm, a, I'm a reader of your newsletter, and I also try to, to not to miss on your podcast, which are always really... Uh, a good source of information and, and uh, done uh, in a very enjoyable way as well. So, Pauline, can you tell us a bit what is behind the Astindo name and what is your, your other work you're doing? Okay. Hi, Wolfgang. Hi, Gary. Thank you for inviting me here. I'm very honored to join and participate in this event. Uh, I'm the new elected president uh, of Astindo, the Indonesian Travel Agents Association. We are based in Indonesia. We have 23 chapters uh, uh, in, 30, in 23 provinces in Indonesia. And our association is also the member of FATA, Federation of ASEAN Travel Association, uh, ASEANTA, ASEAN Tourism Association, and also WTA, World Tourism Alliance, and also the WTAAA, World Tourism uh, World Travel Agents Association Alliance. Um, our mainly activities before and after the pandemic is actually we have our consumer travel fair and before the pandemic of course we have held it in several cities Jakarta, Bali, uh, Palembang, Padang and also Surabaya the five biggest cities in Indonesia and we also will have the virtual uh, travel travel fair we uh, maybe in November or December and we also have the Astindo Travel Mart this travel mart is actually to uh, to enlarge the network between Indonesian tour operators with the uh, foreign tour operators uh, around the world. So we, uh, from 2018 to 2019, we've, we have invited uh, travel agents around the world to come to Indonesia to participate in our Astindo Travel Fair, Astindo Travel Mart, and also we host them for the fam trip in Indonesia as well. And also we do uh, organizing roadshow with some travel associations, uh, then they can promote their 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 destinations in Indonesia to our members, and we can also promote our destinations to them. Uh, we also do, as usual, training for our members to increase the human resources capacity. Uh, and yeah, I think that's all uh, our main activities for Astindo. Okay, and and also you are also running your own uh, uh, operator and travel agency, right? 
Yeah, my 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 father's company actually. It's Elector. It's named Elector. Okay, very good. Yeah. So so uh, as everybody can see, obviously uh, the two of you are concerned uh, about the development of tourism in Indonesia and uh, also about the Chinese market twenty four seven for a long time. And so I'm I'm uh, looking forward to our discussion. To get the ball rolling, uh, I have prepared a little presentation, which uh, maybe we can have a look at uh, now. And uh, following that, of course, uh, we will go and have uh, the discussion. And so let me let me see that I can uh, show you this little presentation. So, and this is uh, emerging trends in China's outbound tourism after the pandemic. Uh, so hopefully soon. Uh, well, you will not be surprised to hear that China is the biggest international tourism source market since 2012. Uh, and also that Indonesia was quite successful in the middle of the last decade. So arrivals jumped from 1 million in 2015 to more than 2 million in 2017. But then it stayed at this level until in, including 2000. 19. What has changed is uh, that the Chinese travelers' demands and preferences have uh, clearly developed during this almost two years now of closed borders, and uh, I will talk about this. So the question is how to prepare for a more sustainable and successful offer for the new wave of post-pandemic Chinese visitors. And you can see on the right hand uh, the development that uh, Chinese alpha tourism has really started from, from small beginnings 20 years ago uh, to uh, big growth. And especially if you look at the orange part here, what is called the rest of the world, so destinations outside of Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan, this is where the growth has been in the last uh, years of the last decade. So, and uh, our forecast is that. Uh, by 2023, we will be basically getting back to that level. And that uh, with Hong Kong still having problems uh, even more than before, the, the rest of the world, yeah, of course, including not the least Indonesia, will see a rather strong growth. So uh, very quickly, uh, I'm the CEO of Kotri, which is a China Outbound Tourism Research Institute. We are based in Hamburg in Germany. And uh, like uh, Astindo, also we are uh, a member of a couple of organizations, including being an affiliate member of UNWTO. And uh, for China, of course, also important, a member of the World Tourism Alliance, which is based in China. Uh, for myself, uh, it's, well, it's sufficient to say maybe that also, of course, as you can see on the right hand side, I've been doing some writing. So I published back in 2006, a long time ago, uh, the first book called China's Outbound Tourism. And uh, last year, the latest one was uh, something which was called Welcoming the Next Chinese uh, Outbound Tourist Wave. So our topic today. And yes, you can see I have a, a number of, of hats I'm wearing. And at the bottom, uh, you can see most important maybe for us today is that I'm, I'm the founding dean of the HATT Business School Institute, which is run by the World Tourism Forum Institute, who is our host for this whole uh, Global Leaders Summit. So uh, what can we see? The trends after 2019 uh, already, we could see that the number of passport holders or people traveling internationally uh, continue to grow up to about 150 million people, which is about 10% of the population, that over time, the sophistication and the experience of China upon travelers have been increasing. Uh, and that as a result, the number of package tours uh, decreased more and more, and people were getting more interested in uh, special interest trips uh, done together with people they, they know and not just meet at the airport. You can see on the right-hand side uh, this uh, 
actually it's not it's not two parts of the market it's three parts of the market we have the traditional group tours and we have at the other end the FITs but more and more important already before the virus struck has been customized travel so where uh, tourists are using a tour operator but for their own uh, itinerary and, and, and uh, the tour operator is organizing this specifically for them a trip according to their wishes. If you look at the other uh, graph at the bottom, you can see also that when we talk about uh, Chinese outbound uh, travelers, the best agers, so uh, persons 55 years or older, have become and will become more and more important. Uh, uh, but also more kids are traveling. Uh, and as well, it's not only Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Shenzhen as a source market, but we see more and more travelers also coming from second level and uh, lower tier cities. And of course, a lot of problems were solved in 2019 already. There is uh, so much information available now for, for Chinese potential travelers from uh, internet sources, but also from uh, peers, uh, from somebody they know either physically or virtually who has been to where they want to travel to. And also the language problem is uh, much smaller now because you have all these nice uh, machines which can uh, help you with a uh, automatic translation, which are now on a quite good level. So this was already happening before uh, the virus struck and still during the pandemic. Uh, and uh, what still is true and will be true in the future is that uh, it's very important uh, as a motivation for the Chinese to see the world with their own eyes and several new experiences and very important gaining prestige uh, from the travel, confirming their status among their peers, but also for their own self-image and uh, following serious leisure or hobby interest that's becoming more and more important that people do uh, something over a couple of trips uh, in different places following their special interest. And of, of course, still following celebrities, their, their idols. And what probably also will not change very much is that uh, the travelers have more money than time. So unlike the Western tourists who might come for three weeks or a month and basically just hang out on the beach, uh, that Chinese have limited time and want to use it to do a lot of different things at the same time. Saying that with the older travelers, uh, there might be a bit less time pressure and we will see, especially for senior travelers, uh, that they stay longer. But main topic today, what can we see? What are the new trends? And this is based on the development of domestic tourism in China last year and this year, but also on a number of surveys done by Kotri and by many other organizations. So uh, we can see travel for other reasons so that it's not only shopping, sightseeing, holidays, but uh, traveling for health reasons, traveling for education and traveling also to uh, new and clean environments uh, will become more important. There is a general increased interest in nature and outdoor activities versus city tourism, which for Indonesia should be uh, good news. There is a clearer increase in the wish to travel with the family. So the pandemic has shown also in China, like in many other countries, I think the value of having uh, the solidarity and the support within your family. And clearly many Chinese are saying in service, we want to go to new destinations where there are not so many other Chinese tourists, which uh, should also be good news for all those places uh, who are, uh, which are not Bali in Indonesia. So smaller destinations rather than big cities, and also more interest in real contact with local culture uh, beyond just taking photos and uh, real interest in having uh, authentic experiences 
And also, we can see there's a big increase, especially among younger Chinese people, uh, in environmental questions and sustainability questions as well. And finally, uh, as we can see, uh, the political development in China feeling uh, stronger and stronger and more and more self-confident that the uh, importance that Chinese visitors want to be feel, feeling welcomed mm -hmm. and treated not as, as good as anybody else, but maybe better than other people. Also, this is something which is increasing. So I think the challenge, not only for the tourism in Indonesia, but for global tourism is that we need a paradigm shift. We need to get out of, of the, let's say, frantic growth period where we had uh, more and more trips, but uh, less and less hospitality as a people-to-people -people, uh, connection and more and more of a let's say, industrial way of organizing big uh, crowds of people and also of uh, tourists getting away from local culture uh, because uh, they were in all-inclusive resorts or uh, there, there was a high level of disnification uh, there. So, and we saw, maybe now many people remember the good old times before the virus, but actually, if we think back, uh, Two years, the big topic was over tourism and the environmental pollution resulting from tourism. So there was a growing criticism. So therefore, uh, it's a good uh, opportunity and high time to react to that. So from my point of view, and of course, I'm very interested to hear uh, what my two guests today, Gary and Pauline, have be uh, have to say to that is so what we have uh, developed uh, in country is the term of meaningful tourism which is the idea that you are concentrating on very good quality not just good quality which is based on a deep understanding of the needs and expectations of the different market segments of the Chinese outbound market and Pauline mentioned already training uh, as an important source for all the information and so moving away from just saying uh we want to increase the number of arrivals uh never mind if maybe they stay a shorter time or spend less money and are less happy with the experience so moving to high levels of satisfaction uh which create more yield by longer stays and higher spending and also very important i think especially for the Chinese market, uh, create recommendation marketing where your visitors are recommending the destination or the service a company to their physical and their virtual friends. So with that, uh, it is uh, something where all stakeholders can, can profit from getting your experiences for the tourists, more benefit for the host communities, uh, which have in some cases reacted even violent, violently to the increase of tourism uh, for the occupation of their city centers or their beaches. And also for staff to gain jobs which are 12 months a year, not just seasonal, for the government obviously to have jobs for their citizens and taxes. And if people feel part of the destination, thereby hopefully also uh, creating a feeling that they are more careful with the environment and uh, do less damage to the natural resources. So and that, uh, of course, means what is very good quality, meaning different things to different market segments, like uh, that you have uh, uh, for younger adult groups, uh, outdoor adventure and so on, for educational trips for family groups. So as we all know, Chinese kids are supposed to learn, learn, learn. Uh, and uh, also a lot of special interest tours. Uh, Chinese, Chinese market has a lot of niche markets and in China, 
the niche is always a million people or so, so it's worthwhile to do very special things if this is people who like nature photography or uh, a lot of Chinese people are still discussing uh, the Second World War. Uh, so we have lots of hobby war historians which uh, will be interested to see sites uh, connected uh, to, to the history of the war, but also bird lovers or people interested in music and, and so on and so on. So what you certainly have to produce for everybody coming from China is that uh, you show that you are specifically prepared uh, and uh, to welcome them and that you are showing respect to the Chinese culture, uh, that you're also well, practically uh, make it possible to pay uh, mobile payment systems. And if uh, China, China Upper Tourism is all about bragging, helping them to have some nice stories to tell to their friends. Uh, and uh, of course, also offer opportunities live streaming, big topic now, that they can show right away how wonderful it is at your place to their peers back home. So, and, and this is something where we can see that in the past, a lot of, lot of efforts have been concentrating on uh, Chinese social media marketing. But if we look at the results, especially if this is not user-generated content, but this is uh, tourism, uh, marketing organizations telling stories. Uh, even the videos are very nice and uh, people in it beautiful. Uh, you, you see there's a very little impact uh, and in many cases, it's simply a, a, a waste of money to do that. Uh, so it's much more effective to promote and support that your customers are themselves recommending uh, your, your services, your place, than anything uh, which advertisement can, can do. So the 4P of marketing, well, you probably all remember from your university days, are actually not just talking about uh, promotion, but it has been mostly reduced to promotion, uh, which then uh, happens uh, well, then that the Chinese tour operators will say, okay, uh, if it's promotion rather than quality, rather than product and place, let's talk about price. And you have a downward spiral in the money you can gain. So what to do? Well, uh, to speak pro domo, if I'm allowed to, uh, using trainings, like uh, we have something called the China Tourism Training Edition 2022, which has been updated especially for the post-pandemic uh, period. And we have a uh, recovery and resilience program called Advantage Tourism, which helps organizations and governments and companies to uh, put all the things I just quickly mentioned into practice. So going well in a, uh, as a summary like this, starting from quality based on knowledge to satisfied customers using not only quantitative KPIs, but also qualitative KPIs, sentiment measurement, how, how happy are people with what we offer them? How can we make them more happy? Two recommendations and from that to higher yield. So this is uh, in a nutshell what I think uh, where we are standing now. And of course, this is a, a more general picture and we will zoom onto Indonesia uh, in our discussion. Maybe just let me briefly mention that uh, there is a couple of free online information sources like uh, Gary. Uh, we also have some uh, well, much less sophisticated, but there is a weekly newsletter which is called Kotri Weekly. And we also started some podcasts which are called Kotri Talks and uh, they are available for you on a regular basis. So with that, uh, let's come back to our panelists. And uh, so maybe, uh, so now starting with, with Pauline, uh, from a tour operator's point of view, so would you say that by 2019, 
the engagement of Indonesia with Chinese outbound tourism has been a full success or uh, has been a part, partly a success or what was your uh, uh, judgment uh, when we were all thinking this will go on like it was before, before we were hearing about a nasty little virus appearing? Well, you know, actually, we are starting. We are. We are. We've been starting to receive a lot of requests from the Chinese tourism tourists since 2015, when our government started to uh, demand or target uh, foreign arrivals must be above 20 million. So by that, our government aim for the Chinese tourists and India tourists, the big, big, huge country. But then, um, when uh, in within two years, since 2018 and 2019, we've experienced the mass tourism in a lot of cities in Indonesia. Uh, there are a lot of there were a lot of charter flights from Chinese China cities to a lot of Indonesian cities, Solo, Batam, Bali, of course, Padang, Medan, Bintan, also Manado, then Pasar, Jakarta, from several cities in China. And when I asked them. Are you satisfied with this kind of charter flight and mass tourism? Some say yes, some say no. The government, of course, say yes because they can get, they can reach that, that target, the, the 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 quantity of the Chinese arrivals. But then, when I ask them, uh, "Are you happy with this, or you want you do you still want to continue this mass tourism, this quantity tourism, or you prefer the quality tourism?" I mean, now the post pandemic. Some of the uh, chairman of the, uh, the, the the tourism board mentioned that they will still want to mix between the mass tourism and the quality of tourism. So I'm actually very happy to see your presentation just now, Prof. It's all about the the, the customized tour, the FIT tour, the the, the niche market. That's what our, our our market actually. That's what we, that's what we want. That's what that's what we want to target from the Chinese arrivals. Uh, well, I would say that uh, our government now are uh, prefer to target the quality tourism. So maybe after uh, post post COVID nineteen. These Chinese arrivals will be uh, cat will will be uh, lesser for the mass tourism, and we will target more on the niche market, as you say, as you mentioned just now, the customize the niche market. Okay, thank you, Gary. What's your take on this? Well, uh, the interesting part um, from what Pauline was saying, this move towards quality tourism, and that's definitely going to be a trend across the region. My first connection between China and Indonesian travel actually was back in uh, 2006. I was living in Shanghai, and I was the editor of Shanghai Business Review. Uh, and my editorial assistant, who was a very, very capable Shanghainese young lady, uh, she'd studied, she'd done a university degree in the UK, she'd come back, she was a brilliant uh, economic researcher. And she came to me one day and she said, uh, can I take some time off? I, I want to go and, and get married. So I said, fine, where are you going? She said, well, I'm not getting married yet, but we want to go and do our photo shoot and we're going to Bali. Uh, so this is 2006. Her and her, her husband-to-be went to Bali, took their photos, came back. And the interest that this generated among our Chinese staff and all her friends, because this was pretty much in the pre-social media era, she brought her photos back. And I've never seen such kind of envy, but, but really it's sort of positive envy amongst all her friends and all our staff. They, she took some beautiful pictures. She'd gone to Bali to do this. They'd hired a professional photographer. They'd hired a professional driver so they could go and do uh, their, their uh, photographs on like uh, mountaintops and also uh, cliffs overlooking the sea. It was beautifully done. And that was 2006. That seems such a long time ago. And if I fast forward that to 2020, my last trip actually outside of Malaysia was, was to Bali before the, the holiday, uh, before the COVID-19. And we hired, we were in the east of Bali and we hired a, a driver. Uh, and this driver was absolutely brilliant. One of the, uh, he, he was, he was uh, recommended to us by the hotel. Really, really good driver. Took us around to all the beautiful sites in northern Bali and north, uh, northeastern Bali. Um, but he told us that uh, he was worried about the, the loss of the Chinese market because this was just after Chinese New Year 2020, but it was before the closure 
um, of, of, of Southeast Asia for all tourism. Um, but he said the Chinese weren't coming and he wasn't sure when they would be coming back. But he was particularly worried because he said he liked having Chinese travelers hire him as a driver for a number of reasons. One, they tended to hire him for at least two or three days. They didn't just hire him for one day. And they wanted to go off track. They wanted to go to Northern Bali or even out to the West to new areas, um, which he said most uh, European or North American travelers didn't particularly want to do. He said North American and European travelers tended to want him to do commentary. So as they were driving around, he would commentate on what he was seeing. He said the Chinese travelers didn't want that. They wanted to ask questions and they only wanted him to ask their own specific questions. And the other thing that I thought was quite interesting is he said that he, um, he'd actually, a few years ago, uh, had done a guided tour for the US pop star, Katy Perry. And he told a couple of years ago, one of his Chinese clients that he'd had Katy Perry in the back of his, uh, of his tour guide. Um, and that obviously had gone viral. And so whenever he got uh, inquiries uh, via WeChat or via WhatsApp or, or via email from Chinese clients, they would ask him, are you the Katy Perry tour guy? And I thought that was a nice story. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, thank you very much, Gary. I think this, this, is, this is also uh, showing already that, uh, so it, it, it pays to know your market. So because um, maybe for, for European uh, customers, they might be mildly interested to know that he has been driving Cape Perry. But for Chinese, this is one of the bragging things. This is one of the stories you can tell your friends. And, and so obviously, so you have to know that this is important for Chinese customers and yeah. use this in your, in your uh, self-advertisement uh, a lot. Uh, and, and also, of course, that uh, obviously the people, the Chinese tourists hiring uh, this driver were not mass, mass market uh, uh, travelers, but individual travelers. And that they are interested to, uh, see a lot of, of places other people have not been going to and they're they're not coming so much just to go to the beach and and just to, to relax but they want to do something and see something and learn something uh, about about the place and not just uh, getting confirmed what they have been reading in the guidebook uh, before and which year which architect built which temple uh, so and and this i think these are good examples that uh in many cases, especially these are, if these are young, educated Chinese, uh, from the outside, they, they speak English and uh, they listen to the same uh, music maybe. And, and uh, so they are familiar with Western food or so that, that you, from the outside, you will think, oh, they're, they're not different. But of course, at this simple level, uh, already you can see the important culture differences. And uh, so certainly when we say, uh, give them very good quality to say, yeah, you will get a driver who has been driving Cape Perry. This is uh, f making a big difference uh, for for that, and this is you you can see you can see this everywhere. I remember I've been to New Zealand a couple of years ago to Queenstown, and there you can have a speedboat uh, drive on, on on the river. And there, were, uh, while you were waiting for your boat, there was a wall full of photographs where you could see uh, which famous persons have been already taking this speedboat, including some famous Chinese film stars. And of course, all the Chinese tourists were taking photos of themselves in front of these photos. So they could show they do the same thing that this uh, famous film star has, has been doing. Uh, so this is, this is, of course, something uh, you, have, you have to do because, well, I mean, Maybe the opposite. I remember being in a in, in a hotel in Davos uh, where uh, Jack Ma was staying during the Davos uh, uh, global uh, conference, and they didn't they didn't even take a photo of that because they didn't know exactly who is this guy. And uh, when I told them, well, you have to tell this to your Chinese customers. You can stay in the same room and eat the same food than. Uh, Jack Ma has been eating, and they said, "Oh, really? Do you think so?" So they were they were not aware of that. So yeah, so this is this is something where I think clearly uh, it is it's it's important to 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 know uh, the market, and so uh, the complaints. I don't know what your driver said to that. The complaints I hear normally from people working 
for Chinese tourists is they don't give tips or not enough <laughs> tips. I don't know. Is this a problem, Pauline? Is this a problem in Indonesia as well? That the Chinese are famous for not giving tips? Actually, it depends on how much have you paid. If you pay enough, then they don't mind if you don't give them tips. But if you don't pay them enough, then it's a, it's a real problem. Uh, yeah, uh, I see. So, so what, what do you say from the... Uh, uh, Pauline, you, you, you mentioned that, of course, from, from the government point of view, it's nice. You can write a press release and saying 28% increase in number of arrivals. That's good for politicians. But yeah. uh, when we're talking about business, uh, if, they, if they stay shorter and pay less, in, in the end, you may end up with less money in your pocket than, than, than before. So, what do you think that in 2019 there was a already some idea in the Indonesian uh, tourism industry with your colleagues uh, through in the organization you're not the, the president of that there need to be a change? Or is, was this not so pronounced yet? Actually, there are quite a lot of discussion among us, ourselves, uh, between the tour operators, the stakeholders. We are saying that this mass tourism actually have the reverse multiplier effect to our industry. You say like wastage and then environment, environmental damage. The, you know, sometimes they just stand out on the coral reef and kick the coral. It's not good for our tourism sustainability. Yes. Uh, so that's what our that's what we said to our government, and they understand about that. You see, like in Maya Island or Boracay, they closed for one or for several months to rebuild the coral and whatever the ecosystem. So uh, yeah, th uh, that's why the government now wants to mix between those the mass tourism and also the quality tourism. Uh, we also ask the government to have. Uh, communication with the Chinese tour operators and also the Chinese airlines not to dump the price you know like uh, from Chinese uh, from China City like Sunchen to Manado for seven days it cost them the, the all inclusion uh, tour package cost them around 600 US dollars only it's impossible so it actually depends on our government how they want our that they they don't give this business to all this that those Chinese mafia. Uh, we want them to re restructure the business, the the, the tourism, the, the travel agent business, and also not give permission to those Chinese tour operator to operate in Indonesia, especially in Bali. Um, we want them to uh, limit the number of Chinese tourists in terms of that uh, mass tourism in order to also support the local economy in our country. Because you, I think it's a common practice in every country as well. You know, when the, the, these Chinese tourists come to certain countries, they do the mass tour, they, they, they come in a group, mass tourism, and then they, also, they are also forced to shop in the souvenir shop. While these souvenir shops belongs to Chinese businessmen, the product itself also made in China. So it's not supporting our local economic at all. This is the practice that we want our government to uh, restructure and yeah, how, how to support our local economic, local communities by shopping in our souvenir shop, eat the local dishes, not in the restaurant, and not staying in the hotel which is operating by uh, which is owning or operating by the Chinese businessmen as well. Yeah, yeah, I mean this is of course what you're saying, this is a very common complaint about what's this what's called the zero dollar tourists, so that uh, you have this very low price tourists and then uh, forced uh, and forced shopping is is uh, where the profit lies. And uh, of course if if you allow me to, to mention one of your competitors uh, Thailand has been doing that, uh, that the Thai government set a minimum uh, price for per day for, for such a trip. And that is obviously a, a very good idea. Uh, saying that, uh, the experience in Thailand, of course, also shows that you can find always ways around. So, uh, so you will, you will uh, 
maybe increase the price, but then give people a kickback or, or something like that. So uh, as long as the competition is only about price, because it's yeah. like the quality of the product is the same, and, and then uh, the only differentiation is if it's $50 more, or $50 less, uh, these regulations will certainly help uh, as, a, as a base. But uh, I think we can see from the experience in, in, in other countries that uh, this is uh, one part of the answer, but it's not the full answer because uh, as long as there is a, a demand for this ultra cheap uh, trips, uh, our Chinese colleagues are creative enough to come up with a, with a way around uh, uh, some hurdles built by the government. So, Gary, you're based in Malaysia. Maybe uh, what what is it? Has there been uh, ideas about such uh, government regulations against zero dollar tourists as well? Yeah, I don't think it's been quite such a problem in Malaysia as, as it has been in, in Thailand or, or Indonesia. Um, but yeah, it certainly happened in the, the provinces of Sabah um, on, in East Malaysia. There were some, some instances of that. That happened for sure. Um, the Chinese tourism here was slightly different, I would say, um, probably because it's a much smaller country. We have less options for travel than Indonesia. Indonesia is such a vast country. You know, it's, it's easy to, 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 to fly into destinations that most people have never heard of. Here, it's a little bit more concentrated. Um, but I think in terms of the whole region, you know, we were moving up to 2019. This issue of over-tourism, this issue of uh, zero-dollar tours, this issue of, uh, you know, abuse, really, in tourism, taking it away from what the industry actually should be, was, was, was starting to gain traction. And, and governments and tour operators, everybody was working together to try and eradicate this. But over the last two years, you know, and it is going to be two years since most people have traveled in this region or have welcomed tourists by the time that it actually happens again. You know, tourism has literally fallen off a cliff. There's been no revenue. Uh, companies have gone bust. Governments have got no tax revenues from tourism, nothing at all. So we've gone from, from uh, over tourism to zero tourism, you know, in, in simple terms. And to rebuild volumes again, are, we, are countries actually going to live up to their promise of saying we only want quality tourists? No, I don't think so, because they're going to need the revenues. They're going to need the flows of people. So we're going to have these issues coming back again, I think. And Indonesia is not the only one. This is going to be across the region because there's going to be huge competition amongst the countries. There was huge competition between Southeast Asian travel uh, countries to attack, attract tourists, as Pauline said, from India, from China, but also from, from each other. You know, each country of, of, of ASEAN uh, was a supplier of tourists to each other one. So we're going to go back into a very competitive market and price will definitely be uh, an issue to begin with, for sure. There'll be huge discounting. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Is there? Yeah, I, I, I'm sure you're, you're right from that. So one solution which has been discussed and... Uh, we have been talking with a couple of uh, partners about this is uh, that, uh, well, Indonesia is obviously a huge country with a lot of different uh, destinations, a lot of different islands. So to try to differentiate regionally to say, okay, this is the mass marketplace and I'm afraid Bali is the number one candidate for that. Uh, but also to say, okay, there are some smaller places where we say this is where you have luxury tourism uh, or also where you have special interest tourists that you can say, okay, this is a place where you have, I don't know, the highest uh, variety of, of birds. So if you are into bird photography, which is a big topic in China, so this is a place we make famous for, this is a place to, to go if you are interested in bird photography, that's the best in all Indonesia for that, so that you are that you are getting away from from uh, saying uh, come to Indonesia, uh, we are cheaper than the others. Uh, to to say okay, there is because certainly there is uh, the mass market is there and will not go away, and and uh, you have to cater for this as well. But um, but so therefore to say it's not a black or white thing. It's not saying stop mass market and only do uh, high quality. Uh, but to, to develop the high quality on top, because I think it's clearly to see that uh, for in China, bragging is important to tell, wow, look I, where I've been. Like you mentioned, 15 years ago, 
Bali was wow, having uh, wedding photos from there, a big thing. Uh, so that that you you build up uh, brand images for specific places and say this is the place where because we have this and this is a resource, this is a place where where you can uh, uh, get uh, something special and then. Uh, but for that, you have to to build to to develop uh, products. So you have to say, okay, if you're interested in in music, we have a three day drumming workshop with some famous local musicians, and you can go there. And there will be uh, also, if needed, an interpreter, and there will be uh, and you get a nice certificate and a nice video afterwards and uh, all that kind of stuff. Do you have to do that? So is this Something which, uh, looking from far away, from an academic point of view, sounds good. So is this something, Pauline, you think you can do this in practical terms in Indonesia? Yeah, actually our government now is building, uh, the developing the five super priority destination. Have you ever heard the, those, the Mandalika in Lombok? Uh, it's aimed for the sport tourism event. They will, they will be the host for the uh, MotoGP in Lombok and yeah. also the Lake Toba the famous our lake our, our famous Lake Toba and also the Jogja the Borobudur Jogja Semarang Solo uh, then Komodo in East Nusa Tenggara and the, the, the last one is Likupang in Manado this is the five super priority destination that have been uh, that have been developed by the government currently and uh, you know this all need support need in a lot of investment and after that the, the investor of course will need the revenue so uh, yeah the mix again the mixture between the mass tourism and the quality tourism will be needed will be, will be much needed and our government now also creating a lot of uh, tourism products like you mentioned uh, tourism village this is the one that uh, have been developing by the government. Then our government now uh, built like more than 200 tourism villages in Indonesia. And also the, the thematic, thematic tourism product, like the wellness, adventure, and music, sport tourism. So, yes, yeah. yes, yes. So, yeah. This is going to attract all this customized and the niche market. Yes, yes, yes. And so, which makes a lot of sense, I think, because I remember uh, that there has been this campaign, which was called 10 New Bali's. Yeah, uh, 10 New Bali is uh, maybe around three years ago. Yes, and, and, and I, was, I was wondering, uh, is it really, is, it, is that what you want to have the situation you have in Bali uh, 10 more times? So, and, and so, so I think what you are saying now, uh, is is quite is quite a development from this idea of just uh, replicating uh, it, it the same uh, kind of tourism in, in, in other places. So, uh, is yeah, this I think the, the the ten new Bali's was was basically just a label because actually the five super priority destinations that Pauline's just mentioned, some of those were included in that ten. But I think it's a very smart move what Indonesia is doing by having these five super priority destinations. Because if we go back to pre-pandemic, you know, there was a reason, there was a specific reason that over-tourism happened in certain uh, destinations. And that's because all the infrastructure was there. It was easier for people to travel there, to travel around, to stay, to, to, to have their experiences. But some of these destinations, Indonesia is a huge country and it's absolutely yeah. stunning. Some, some of these uh, areas that Pauline's mentioned, they, they are absolutely beautiful. But if you actually think of the, the, the challenge of marketing Indonesia internationally or to Chinese tourists, it's immense because you have, what, 17 and a half thousand islands. It's an immense country. I think focusing not just the marketing on five destinations, but focusing that for infrastructure development, as Pauline said, uh, looking at the way you can get flights into these destinations is a very clever way of actually showing the diversity of the country in five specific destinations. So although they got labeled with this new Bali's, that's not particularly what they're trying to do. I think each destination will be slightly different, um, but they want to achieve the success of Bali. I think that's the, the kind of where the label comes from. Yeah, so how much, how much of this is done specifically for the Chinese market? I don't think it's specifically for the Chinese market. I think Indonesia wants to um, 
expand or, you know, if you look at Bali, for example, in, in 2019, I think 55% of the market was China and Australia. So two big markets take out, you know, and if those two, those two markets disappear, which they have right now, you, it's very difficult to, to get a comeback. You know, I think a lot of the investment into some of these uh, new destinations will come from the Middle East, for sure. You know, there's a lot of opportunities for Middle East tourism in Indonesia, China as well. Pauline mentioned India, which is a huge, was a huge rising market for the region, particularly for uh, Bali uh, pre-pandemic. So Korea, Japan, you know, that it's diversifying your, your markets. That's really where Southeast Asia needs to look in future, because although China was very, very important in this region, you know, if you take China out of the equation, it means that tourism really and the economies really, really suffer. And that's been absolutely noticeable over the last 18 months. Pauline, what do you agree to that? Well, actually, you, you, the, the 10 new Bali's is not only to aim the Chinese market, but also for the different markets, also for Indonesian market. But, you know, unfortunately, during 2019, there, there was a very uh, bad situation for the domestic market. You know, the air ticket price for the domestic market is even more expensive compared to the international air ticket price. Say like from Jakarta to Manado, my flight from Jakarta to Manado, it took like uh, it took about three and a half hours. It's almost the same like Jakarta to Bangkok. Yes. The price for Jakarta to Manado cost me around four hundred US dollars, while for flying to Jakarta to Bangkok cost me around two hundred US dollars only. Sometimes less than that by low cost carrier. Sometimes less than that. So these ten new Bali's, which are uh, developed by the government, uh, Borobudur Temple, Blitung, Mount Bromo, Labuan Bajo, Komodo, Lake Toba, Thousand Island, Mandalika, Lombok, Wakatobi, Tanjung Lesung in the Banten nearby the uh, Jakarta Airport, and also Morotai in North Maluku. These ten new Bali's uh, have been developed by the government, but unfortunately not a lot of Indonesians or the foreigners come to these destinations because of the accessibility. Yeah, so they created, uh, the government created a lot of channels from the uh, access from Chinese or from the other market fly to these cities directly in order to uh, uh, more, more tourists come to, come to these cities. I yeah, that's a, I think that's a really good point that Pauline's made. <clears throat> Pauline's made that. I mean, if you look at the, the biggest inbound market to Bali in 2019, actually wasn't China or Australia. It, it was Indonesia because it's such a huge country. And domestic tourists actually made up a, a huge proportion of the, of the visitors. It has a huge air market. One of the, when it's operating properly, Indonesia has one of the world's biggest aviation markets. So there is a huge opportunity, as Pauline says, in the domestic market, for sure. Yes. So... So maybe uh, let us finish by, by looking into the crystal ball. So uh, 2024, let's say, uh, when hopefully all the development of last year and this year is a, a, a distant nightmare, uh, we all can't believe actually happens. Uh, 2024, how will Chinese outbound tourism to Indonesia look like well hopefully <laughs> fingers crossed uh higher than 2019 perhaps the, the 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 chinese arrivals to indonesia but i don't know uh did you hear about the the china walk 5-1 policy in their aviation in their aviation aviation industry yes the, uh, yeah they only limit the airlines to have just like a one international flight per week. Uh, it seems that they want to extend it until next year, if I'm not mistaken, the quarter one next year. Uh, I'm not sure whether uh, with this policy, whether they can have the charter flight to Indonesia or not, or to other country or not. But if they can have like the charter flight, uh, maybe before 2024, we will have more Chinese arrivals come to Indonesia because you know like like now during even during the pandemic there are there are, there were some charter flights uh, actually but it's actually for the Chinese workers arrive in Indonesia uh, Manado and also in Jakarta they went to some uh, they, 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 they were sent to some islands for working yes 
Gary, what's so 2024? Well, I think perhaps the one thing that the pandemic has taught us is probably not to make predictions. But 2024, it seems a long time away, but it, but it isn't really. 2021 is almost gone. 2022, we know, is going to be a slow recovery year, I think, across the region. Um, we're looking for growth again in 2023 and 24, as your statistics said at the beginning. I think op uh, the opportunities for Indonesia are definitely there. It, it has incredible tourism products. I mean, it's just a, such a vast, beautiful country. The opportunities are there to really attract uh, the Chinese tourists who, who probably would have gone to, to Indonesia in the intervening years anyway and explored, they may have been to Bali to, uh, once or twice and wanted to explore more of the country. Um, but it will come down to, as Pauline said, right, you know, it will come down to how they can rebuild the flight networks, where they will come from, whether there will be charter flights, whether there will be uh, more uh, FIT travel coming back from China. Um, but of the countries in the region that I think has huge opportunity for Chinese tourism, yeah, Indonesia will be very, very high on that list. So what, what can Indonesia do, uh, again, looking forward to a couple of years, uh, to increase the brand image towards a more uh, luxurious uh, destination or, or a destination People are proud of saying, oh, I've been going to Indonesia. That's all. Is this, or do we have to do this for specific parts of Indonesia, specific regions of Indonesia, uh, so that you don't have to compete over price only? So well, I, will, I, I will say that increasing the human capacity resources is one of the most important things, rather than build, developing all the 5A, the attraction, activities, amenities, accommodation. We all have that accessibility. We all have that. But increasing the human resources capacity will be a good start. Uh, a lot of more people can speak Chinese, more people can uh, appreciate them as tourists. Uh, yeah, so because this Chinese market actually is like uh, Tom and Jerry in our tourism industry. <laughs> it's between love and hate. <laughs> That's a nice way to put it. <laughs> Yes, but, but I'm, 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 I'm sure I'm sure you're right. So that is, uh, uh, but of course it is in many places. Uh, well, also here in Europe, uh, we, we kind of, you have Tom and Jerry is a very good way to put it. Uh, you have uh, very different uh, uh, reactions. You have some people who say, "Oh, I don't want to have Chinese tourists come back anyway because their their mind Chinese tourists are." 45 people in a, in a coach jumping out of the coach, taking a photo, eating Chinese food, buying in Chinese shops and, and, uh, and, and damaging the environment and not caring about what, what they leave behind. Uh, but there are others who are, who are saying, yeah, this is uh, for us a key future market because they are saying, okay, uh, we see that there is a, a, a growing number of people interested in something special. And if we can, once we can attract this kind of people and they like it, that will start a conveyor belt and there will be 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 new visitors coming for this special topic almost automatically once you have established that this is for this kind of, of uh, uh, special interest, this is the right place to go to. So, and I think this, this is probably uh, the same. And Pauline, I, I, I think, Clearly, I fully agree. Uh, in the end, we are a people-to-people -people industry. And, I, and this is what I tried to say also in the presentation at the beginning. This is what we have to come back to. So this is, I think, what has been, has been lost in, in many ways. That, so I don't want to be, uh, let's say, it, 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 it used to be in a hotel, it used to be, to be Mr. Smith, to being Mr. Smith in room 715, to being room 715. Uh, so, so more and more remote. And, and I think when we, we need to come back that you're Mr. Smith or Mr. Lee or Mr. Wang or Mrs. Wang, uh, again, that you, that you feel that, that you are there as, as a person. And, and that also that you are, I think you have a, a growing interest uh, of people uh, uh, attracted and interested in the local culture and, 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 and the local people and you have less language problems because you have this little machines 
uh, you can talk it to and, and, and they will uh, translate into many different languages. So that there is opportunity. And basically, I think from all the experiences, you earn more money. <laughs> and that's in the end why we do that. Uh, so you earn more money if you have people staying longer and uh, do, doing something where it's, if you say we have a beautiful beach, well, there are so many beautiful beaches, the, automatically the answer is how much? <laughs> so, uh, so if you say, well, we have this very special thing you can only have here, and you mentioned some examples, of course, uh, uh, you can have some animal li living only on, on this uh, Komodo Island and nowhere else, then uh, there, it's not a question of, of, of price. Uh, and, and you can see that Chinese, uh, if you take like Galapagos or Antarctica, really expensive destinations, lots of Chinese go there because it gives you all breaking power. So I think therefore that is probably the idea uh, to, to label some specific regions and you mentioned a lot of them and Gary uh, supported that of course there's a, a lot of very, very wonderful places still to be uh, discovered. Uh, and this is what the Chinese are saying. Well, I want to go to new places, to places where not so many other Chinese people have already been. Uh, so that this is a huge opportunity. But then you better not call it another Bali, but uh, give it a more fanciful name uh, uh, um, and make clear that this is for those people who are, uh, who are uh, have more experience, uh, so that you have this. The tourists go there, but the travelers go uh, to the special place, something like that. So, so what you would basically, I see, well, we are all optimistic that uh, we come out stronger out of this. And, and I think we have the opportunity to, if we want it or not, that we had all to, have to, to take a pause and all to, to reflect on what we are doing. And uh, so let's hope that with. Uh, the private companies uh, Astindo is representing uh, and with the government uh, policies coming together that we can actually have a, a better uh, Chinese opportunity to Indonesia in the future. I think the, the good news is from all the surveys you can see there is a growing demand for that. So for, for doing things which go beyond just having a cheap trip and, and spend all your time in, in shops. Uh, so shopping is one of the decreases in, uh, in importance you can see everywhere because you have now uh, lots of online shops also from luxury brands. You have Hainan Island as a duty-free uh, destination. So I think the time, the willingness of the Chinese uh, to spend all the time in, in, in shops is also decreasing. So I think there's a, uh, even so at the moment we are still, uh, Worried, uh, I think there is there is a a light at the end of the tunnel, which might be a Chinese lantern. So with that, I think uh, I again cannot not thank enough both of you to uh, uh, give us your insights and and your time, and uh, for everybody uh, watching this, I hope that the whole. Uh, Global Tourism Summit uh, Indonesia has been uh, informative and inspiring uh, for you and uh, there are new programs uh, following this one but for now I think we have to say goodbye to Pauline and goodbye to Gary and thank you very much again and for everybody stay healthy. <laughs>